I have enjoyed being with you this weekend. I enjoyed the men's retreat, getting to know you and uh, talking to so many of you and renewing acquaintance with Brother Tim and uh, his family. And it's been a great blessing to me to be here. And I want to say thank you for all that you've done for me. Uh, I'm just blessed. I was thinking a moment ago during the coffee break, everybody was talking and laughing and talking loudly. And I thought, this is what heaven is like. You know, that's, that's, that's the way heaven's going to be. It's not going to be a sad, somber place. And uh, I am grateful for that. Let me ask you to turn today to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. The title of my message today is the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. Paul wrote many of our New Testament books. You know that already. And uh, most of these books were written to churches. We have 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus that were written specifically to men who were working in churches, but uh, most of the other books were written to churches themselves. 1 Thessalonians begins by saying, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives them a blessing. He says, Grace be unto you, and pre- peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins to speak to them. So as we begin this morning, let's begin with a word of prayer, and let's ask God to open our hearts to this wonderful letter that Paul is writing to encourage this church. Father, we thank you today again for the privilege, Lord. What an honor it is to stand in this pulpit area, Lord, and preach the Word of God. We know, Lord, that it's Your Word. It's not our Word. It's Your truth, not our truth. It's Your service, not our service. It's Your name to be glorified, not our name. It's Your Son who died. It's Your Spirit who moves among us. We, we just pray, O oh God, that this service might be all about You, And our hearts might be lifted to you today. Lord, we thank you for this letter that you sent through the Apostle Paul. And I pray, O God, that you might apply it to us as we read it today and as we think about it. And as we hear the message that you have for us. Thank you again for what you're doing here, Lord. I just praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, Paul wrote many letters to many of the churches in this New Testament era. His method was to go into a city, find the nearest Jewish synagogue, go into that Jewish synagogue as a Pharisee and as a teacher, and when they recognized him as a visitor and a visiting teacher, they would ask him, because they wanted to be courteous, if he might have some sort of a message that he might like to share with the rest of the congregation. And of course, the Apostle Paul knew that he had a message that he would kind of like to share with the rest of the congregation. And he would get up and he would preach Jesus unto them. If you go back to Acts chapter number 19, is it? Or Acts 17, maybe? Here's, here's his method. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyonna, they came to Thessalonica. Now listen, where was a synagogue of the Jews? And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, listen to what he did. He reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, the Old Testament. He opened and alleged that Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, that these Jews were looking for, had to suffer and had to be raised from the dead. 
Now wait a minute. That is not the message that the New Testament era Jews wanted to hear. What they wanted to hear was that God was going to send a great military leader and that He would raise up the Jewish nation and that Jewish nation would overthrow Rome and all of its oppressors and that it would become the mighty world power and that God would be glorified again through the Jewish nation. The Apostle Paul comes in and they say, well, we have a rabbi here. He's visiting with us. Uh, Sir, would you have a message for us? And Paul would stand up and say, let me read to you about our Messiah. And they'd say, oh great, he's going to tell us about this military leader who's going to come and run the Romans out. And then he would, he would stand up and he would tell them about the life of Christ. And he would take the Old Testament. I would imagine, I don't know this, but I would imagine he probably preached to them from Isaiah 53. He probably gave them other passages, Psalm 22. And showed them how that when the Messiah came, he wouldn't be a conquering military Messiah, but that he would be a suffering servant that He would come and give His life as a sacrifice for sins. I can imagine that the Apostle Paul went back through Leviticus and, and some of those other uh, parts of the Torah and would tell them how Jesus is the Lamb that God was requiring of them. They didn't want to hear that. What they wanted to hear was that Jesus was coming to conquer. But the Bible says that He... Uh, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is the Messiah. In other words, we're not looking for one to come. He's already come. And He's already suffered. And He's already been raised from the dead. And we have a Messiah now. And He'll save us from our sins. And He'll cleanse our hearts. And He'll make new creatures out of us. Well, of course, there were many there that were hungry for the Word of God. And God had it set up. And people were saved. And that's where the Thessalonian church came from. But at the same time, there were people who hated God and hated the Gospel and fought Paul. And so there, Paul has to leave in a hurry. The Bible tells us, that they left by night and went to Berea. And there in Berea, you know what Paul did? Exactly the same thing. And preached the gospel to the Bereans. And the fact is, they were more noble than the Thessalonians and actually got the Scriptures down themselves to see if what Paul was saying was true. And many were saved in Berea. But he's left now and he's gone to Athens. He's gone other places. He's writing back to the Thessalonian church. I was amazed when I realized that when he writes to the church at Thessalonica, he, he, he does some tremendous bragging on them. He really compliments them. Look, look at chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. He, he says, verse 2, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. He said, we remember without ceasing your faith work, your labor of love, the way you endure in your hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says this, he says, knowing brethren beloved, the King James says, knowing brethren beloved, your election of God. Your ESV says, knowing that you're chosen of God. The the truth is, Paul is saying, I know that you are a bunch of saved people there. And then he brags about them some more. He says, because when our gospel came to you, the way I know you're saved is the way our gospel came to you. And when it came to you, it came in power. And it came personally in the Holy Spirit. It came with assurance. And you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And here's what happened when the gospel came to you. You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much afflictions with joy of the Holy Ghost. Paul is saying, you Thessalonican church, you 
you receive the Word of God. Then you didn't just receive it. The Bible says you became followers of it. And, and you didn't just follow the Gospel, but the Bible says you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the Word of God, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad. Paul said, so that we don't need to tell anybody about what's going on over at Thessalonica. Your faith is talked about all over Asia. Everywhere I go, they say, do you hear what's going on over there at Thessalonica? Did you hear what's going on over there? I got to tell you, you're a little bit like that. What is this, Grace Community Church? Is that the name of it? Grace Community, I have to figure out where I am sometimes. Grace Community Church, you're a lot like that. Every time I hear somebody talking about you, I hear someone saying, do you realize what they're doing down there? Do you understand how the gospel is going out of that place? Do you know they've got a missionary over here and they've got a missionary over there and that they've got this family in the church that's preparing to go so and so? And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, that's something. The Word of God is coming out of that little church down there. He says, for they themselves show what manner of entering in had unto you and how you turn from idols... To serve the living and true God. Isn't that a great thing to say about a group of people? I'm looking, I'm, looking, I'm looking around this morning at a bunch of former idol worshipers. Isn't that a blessing? Hey, listen, I was, I was saved in a, in a shouting Baptist church. You can say amen, it won't bother me. <laughs> If God saved you out of idolatry, lift your hand. I see that hand. <laughs> God saved you out of idolatry. And listen to what he says. He says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God. And I believe you've turned to serve. That's what the church is about. I wish every church understood that we turn from idols to serve the living and true God. Not just to have a place, not just to go to church. You know how the normal church is, don't you? You come in on Sunday morning, you call everybody brother and sister, you shake hands with each other, maybe nut hug necks, uh, you listen to the sermon, you go home, or you go to the cafeteria and wait in line, eat a big dinner. If you're, really, if you're really sold out, you come back Sunday night, if you have a Sunday night service. And uh, if you're a fanatic, you even come on Wednesday night. You know. And it usually goes from, let's just have a little... Uh, imaginary church here. It goes from 100, and then Sunday night, 50, and then about 15 on Wednesday night. They're, they're the fanatics, you know. Nothing that happens at church on Sunday morning then has anything to do with what's going on in your life on Monday morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning and Thursday. That's average church. But I want to tell you, the Thessalonian church was a church that had turned from idols to serve God. They may have to go to work on Monday morning, but they're thinking about how they're going to get the gospel to somebody else. And how they're going to take the gospel somewhere else. And so that's, that's a great commendation to this church. And he says, you also have come together as a church to wait for the Son... God's Son from heaven, who He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And so he begins his letter just by, just by stating some obvious facts about this church at Thessalonica. It's a great church. I've had the experience in my life when I, when I read the New Testament and, and I read through the letters of Paul... 
Uh, sometimes I read through the letters of Paul and I say, boy, that must have been Paul's favorite church. I read Philippians and I think, boy, he must have really loved those Philippian Christians. And then I read through Ephesians and I think, what truth he just laid on these Ephesians. He must have really loved the Ephesians. And then I read Thessalonians and I hear him saying, oh, how I love you. I treated you like a father would treat its child. That's what the next chapter is about. And how I just took you up like a nurse and loved on you. And I worked with my hands and made tents so you wouldn't have to pay me anything or keep me up. And, and you, you remember how it was with us. We had a great time in the gospel, Paul said. You know how that was. He loved these churches. He loved his churches. I believe Paul would have looked around here this morning and I believe his heart would have been absolutely filled with joy seeing all these young people and all these young married people and both of you old people. I think he would have, I think, I think he would have, I think he would have had great joy in his heart to have seen what's going on in this place. But now hear me. The devil has you in his sights. God's blessing you. There's a lot of good, 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 good things going on here at this church. But don't you doubt for a second that Satan has you in his sights. Paul gives a timely warning to this church. Look over at chapter number 4, if you will. In chapter 3 and verse 7, he says, he kind of sums up his feelings about this Thessalonian church by saying to them, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. He said, this is my attitude toward you. What thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before God. He said, we pray for you night and day. We pray for you all the time. And ask God to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. He said, you, you're, you're our joy. As he said to the Philippians, you're our joy and crown. Well, we just, we just praise God for you. And then he says in chapter 4, listen. Furthermore. When we beseech you, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. That every one of you should know how to discipline your own body in sanctification and honor. And not in lustful sinfulness. Even as the Gentiles do who know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. That is, take his brother's wife. Because that the Lord is a, an avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but He's called us to holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man but God, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Right in the middle of a time of awesome encouragement the apostle paul stops to give a, a terribly important warning let me tell you something when you have i don't know how many is here 200 young people you love one another you love christ you're strong, you're healthy, you're pure in your mind, have right desires. If you're not careful, I'm giving you 
The same warning Paul gave the Thessalonians. If you're not careful. You see, the devil has you in his sights. What? 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 I want to ask you if you've lost your mind. Have you lost your mind? When's the last time you realized we are really in a very, very dangerous situation in this church? Satan has traps set all over the place for us. Why would he do that? Look at your map. That's why he would do that. Look at your age. That's why he would do that. Think just for a moment, if you will, of the ministries and the churches that were going bang, 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 bang for God that got tripped up in this very area of sexual impurity that the Apostle Paul is talking about. Several weeks ago, there was a website that was hacked. And the people had been visiting that website, their names began to appear in public that they had visited this website. And the website was, was promoting adultery, is what it amounts to. There have been pastors who've... I, I read about a theology professor in Florida who committed suicide because... His name came up on this website where prostitution and adultery what was it? Madison Avenue, I think, was the name of that thing. And, and its, its little logo was, your life is short, have an affair. You hear me, your life is short. You better stay clean. You, you hear me. God knows listen to me young men God knows what you look at on the internet you better hear me <laughs> Zeke knows what you look at on the internet now some of you don't know what I'm talking about but I met a fellow this past week who works for the city of Savannah, Georgia, and his job is to go on the internet and look around and find people, and if he, can, he watches where they go on the internet. And as he watches where they go, if they go anywhere near Savannah, bang, he starts shooting them ads to help them buy stuff in Savannah or come to Savannah as tourists. Now that's his job. There's somebody watching you when you go to those websites. There's at least four people who know about it. You know about it. God knows about it. The devil knows about it. No such thing as secret sin, by the way. And whoever it is who's trying to sell you something knows about it. And you see, you're part of this church right here that's reaching to Nicaragua and China and Africa and Asia and South America. And the devil puts his sights on you. Are you, are you listening to me? Here's what Paul said to this wonderful missionary church about whom he says the gospel trumpets forth. It trumpets forth from you. Listen to what he says to them. Remember the commandment we gave you in the Lord Jesus. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication, sexual impurity. Young lady, the Lord knows what those novels are full of that you're reading. Oh, but Brother Mike, it's just, it's just innocent pastime. The Lord knows what's in that stuff and those lurid descriptions that you're reading about and thinking about in your mind.
The Lord knows all of those things, folks. Now somebody's going to sit there and get mad and say, I don't like him preaching that way. I don't care. Because there's somebody here guilty. There's somebody better be hearing what I'm saying. And if you're not guilty of what I'm talking about today, forget it. But somebody better perk up. You see, all the devil needs is just two or three. Just two or three. Just get, just get, just, you know, just get, just get a little flirtation going somewhere. A little bit of adultery over here. A little sexual impurity in here somewhere. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. All it takes is one. One. That's all it takes. The devil can get the right one. Reputation's ruined. Ministry start going downhill. You say, Brother Mike, I don't think that could happen. It's happened all over our country. It's happened all over this nation. You know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus. He says, don't live like the Gentiles live. And that's our problem, guys. Listen, ladies, that's our problem. We live like the Gentiles live. If we're, if we're not careful, we do that. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you know the word modesty has gone completely out of the English language almost? The culture that we live in mocks at modesty. And yet the Bible teaches that a woman is supposed to dress in modest apparel. Men should look like men. I don't think a man has to look like a white Caucasian hick from Kentucky, but... But I think a man ought to look like a man. I think when you look at a man, you ought to be able to say that's a man. From the front and the back. Amen. You're preaching, Brother Mike. Thank you, sir. Amen. I think a woman ought to look like a woman and act like a woman. I don't think, I, in God's church, listen, these are the place, the devil will come at you through the flesh. That's how he comes at you. Through the world and through the flesh, the culture and the flesh. That's how he comes at you. God's blessing you too much to let that happen. If you're involved in something like that, you need to think about it and pray and say, Oh God, grant me repentance. Help me to turn. For Jesus' sake, for the Gospel's sake, for the work of Christ's sake, for the work of God through our church's sake, for Your name's sake throughout the world, help me to turn. Just exactly as I preached this morning, the Word of God is not bound. I'll tell you, wicked works can have irreparable damage. And you sitting there thinking, I don't matter, and it doesn't matter what I do in my life, is the very one Satan's looking at to try to get in to cause harm. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Holiness. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be like Jesus. Guys, you ought to look at these girls like they're your sister. You ought to be ready to whip somebody who's not looking at them like that. And girls, you ought to be looking at these boys like they're your brother. You say, but we're not married. What if God wants us to get married? He's very well able to make that apparent. That woman sitting over yonder and that fellow sitting over yonder can know God wants them to marry and they don't have to sit right here. Say, so how can that happen? I don't know. How in the world come into existence? 
He's God. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I am saying to you today, God doesn't work through our uncleanness. He works through our holiness. So He's called us to holiness. Remember, remember the next time you're tempted to give in to this culture and to give in to this, this stuff that's going around you. Remember, he that despises, despises not man, but he despises God who has given unto us his Holy Spirit. Well, I stand before you today. It's, it's a terrible thing when you, when you despise the work of the Holy Spirit. What's He doing in us? He's constantly leading us to holiness. So Paul brags on the church. He brags on the church. And then in the middle of his bragging on this church to encourage them and to help them in the things of God, he stops and he warns them. And he says, God is the avenger of those who would become unclean sexually. Listen, Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, all of these places had cultures much like our culture today. And everywhere you turned, sexuality was placed in front of them every, everywhere they turned. And it's so with us today. You say, well, how do we conquer this? Well, I've got news for you. God never said to conquer it. He said to flee from it. Flee from it. Get away from it. Don't even wait to tie your shoes. Get out of there. Don't try to win her to Christ. Get out of there. Don't make one excuse after another to be around it. Get out of there. Get out of there. That's God's way. Flee fornication. Then he says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And de indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. And, and all that are in Macedonia. But we, we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. You see, he's saying to them, don't quit loving one another. Just love one another in Jesus. Do you get it? You don't want to be cold and indifferent toward each other. But you don't want to be fleshly. You want to love each other in Christ. And you can do that. You can do that. Paul ends the book with a great, great exhortation concerning the promise of Christ's coming. Look down at verse 13, chapter 4. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or dead, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. In other words, He said, I got this directly from God. I got this directly from Jesus. That we which are alive... And remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before them that are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise up first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's when our work will be done. That's when we can take the maps down. That's when we can say, Hallelujah, now we're with Jesus. It's when the Lord comes. And then he exhorts them. He says, guys, you don't have to wonder about the times and the seasons. He says, you, you know perfectly well that the Lord's going to come as a thief in the night. He's not going to announce it. Wouldn't it be something if He came now? He's not going to announce it. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. I like the change, I like the change of pronouns there. For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come upon them 
as travail upon a woman and with a child or with a child, and they shall they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, let, let me finish. Let me get through with the message right here. One of the greatest things to help you in your sanctification is not some mystical experience somewhere, but a genuine and very practical belief and trust in the second coming of Jesus Christ. To believe that Christ is coming soon. I, I'm, I'm confident that the Lord is going to come in my lifetime. I don't know that. But I know He flat could. He could any moment. I've got a little book in my study. The title of the little book is The Last Days Are Here Again. <laughs> and it explains how over the centuries people have come up to a certain period of time and it looked like all the signs of the second coming had come into line and they just knew Jesus was about to come. Well, we're there again. We're there again. You know what the Bible says? We're not to have all the signs figured out. It says be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Guys, if you're humped over a computer screen somewhere looking at something you ought not be looking at, you're not ready. Ladies, if you're sitting off the corner somewhere reading some old lurid novel, you're not ready. I just use those two things. It's those two things. There's a thousand other things that are involved. Such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man coming. Now listen, that's destruction for the world. That's hope for us. That's hope for us. Do you understand? There's coming a day when church won't let out. There won't be a final amen. I've got a friend. He, you know, we have this idea of church. That everybody's walking around in white robes and the angels got white wings. And we're all sitting on white clouds and I have a friend who was talking to his little boy, and his little boy said, I don't want to go to heaven. His daddy said, you don't want to go to heaven? And he said, no. And he said, why don't you want to go to heaven? He said, white clothes, white clothes, white clothes. He wanted to be able to get out and get dirty. Couldn't stand the thoughts of white clothes. Heaven's not like that. I was sitting over there a while ago thinking, heaven's like this. They are laughing. They're hugging one another. They are experiencing pure love. And if Jesus walks into the room, they all stop and bow and worship and weep and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then they laugh and they hug and they renew old acquaintance. And <laughs> they look at somebody and say, wow, I didn't know you were going to be here. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Heaven's a wonderful place. No boy will answer and say, yeah, God saved me five years after our lives parted. God saved me. Folks, you're like the church at Thessalonica. From you is sounding out the word of the Lord. It trumpets from this place. Praise God. But you remember, Satan's got you in his sights. You live clean. You walk with God. You be filled with the Spirit. You watch for Jesus to come. Because one of these days He's coming. One of these days He's coming.